This question was submitted by Lisa, and it's about migraines. It says, hi, Rhonda. My physician recommended a blend of of the following. He says it has scientific evidence to prevent recurring migraine headaches. So B2, melatonin, magnesium, and CoQ10. Is this true? Are there other factors? It's been a while since we've talked about migraines, so I was happy to go into this a little more deeper. I know that there's actually quite a few people that are affected by migraines, which aren't just typical headaches. They're really sort of a complex neurological disorder that involves a lot of different things going on, hyperexcitability in the brain, you know, inflammation, neuropeptide, um, a neuropeptide called calcitonin gene-related peptide, and all these things can contribute to, you know, pain and vascular changes during like a migraine attack. So um, I do think there's good news here. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of these biological pathways are modifiable through lifestyle. And I think that if you can make a few small consistent changes then you really can raise the sort of quote unquote migraine threshold that really kind of makes it more difficult to trigger trigger a migraine attack, right? So um, let's start with some lifestyle factors that do have a big effect, starting with sleep. Sleep disruption is actually one of the most commonly reported migraine triggers. You know, even one night of poor sleep can shift neurotransmitter balance. It can increase brain excitability and suppress melatonin production. And treatment of insomnia in migraine patients has actually been shown to reduce headache frequency. Um, Melatonin is also interesting in this context because it has an anti-inflammatory and it has pain modulating effects. There was a randomized controlled trial that compared three milligrams of melatonin at bedtime with 25 milligrams of a prescription drug for migraine prevention and um, it, this drug is called amitriptyline. And so after three months, mel- melatonin actually performed just as well in reducing headache frequency, and it had fewer side effects. And there was also a meta-analysis that suggested melatonin not only reduced headache frequency, but also duration, severity, and it reduced the use of painkillers compared to placebo. Um, you know, so... Interesting, right? In this in this study, you know, the the migraine medicine did perform better than melatonin and those other, you know, parameters, but melatonin did perform better than placebo and melatonin also did was, you know, at least the same in in re- in reducing headache frequency. So, I think that's something that's really worth mentioning. If you're someone that's struggling with migraines, I think really prioritizing both sleep regularity, so going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time every day, very important for sleeping good. Um, you don't, People don't realize this, but like sleep regularity is a very, very important factor in, you know, having good sleep, consistent good sleep. And then obviously there's the good sleep hygiene that we've talked about a million times. That's also very important. Another big player in migraines is stress. You know, when you're under a lot of stress, the, this nerve network, which is like the main one of the main pathways involved in migraines, it becomes more reactive and it releases that neuropeptide I talk about that drives migraine pain and inflammation. And there have been studies that have shown that behavioral interventions like doing sort of relaxing training, doing biofeedback, doing cognitive behavioral therapy, like all these things that reduce the stress also reduce migraine frequency by anywhere up to like 35 to 50 percent. So pretty close to what you're seeing. I mean, these are like pharmaceutical grade preventatives in, in, in my opinion. So I think, you know, even just doing something like simple daily breath work, mindfulness, you know, meditation, anything that's gonna help you reduce your stress will have an effect on migraine frequency as well. Um, something people often overlook and I, you know, it, it, it goes back to the question we were talking about earlier from James with respect to being overweight and cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes risk. Everything's linked to obesity and obesity also really increases the risk of high migraine frequency up to sixfold. Um, it's not the only cause, obviously, like people that have these underlying other causes of migraines, the obesity kind of brings that you know, that threshold up where you're, you're, you're really getting a higher occurrence of migraine, migraine frequency. And actually weight loss has been shown to reduce both the frequency and intensity of migraine attacks in clinical studies. Um, mechanistically, this probably 
is linked to, you know, you're getting a reduction in systemic inflammation, you know, hormonal changes that occur when you lose weight. A lot of a lot of those things play a role in migraines as well. Another factor that's probably, I would say, pretty underappreciated as well is hydration. You know, there's it's very important to make sure you're not you know, skipping, skipping the water. In fact, I know there's times when I get dehydrated where all of a sudden I don't get a migraine, but I get headaches. And um, there was one randomized controlled trial that had participants drink about a liter and a half more of water each day for 12 weeks. And that group had fewer headache hours. They had a lower intensity um, of headaches compared to the controls. It's a very simple intervention. It does seem to matter you know, I think generally speaking, adults should aim for about two to three liters of water a day. It, this is also related to caffeine, and caffeine is one of those double-edged swords. You know, caffeine blocks adenosine receptors in the brain. Adenosine normally builds up throughout the day and promotes the widening of blood vessels, right? So you're dilating your blood vessels. Um, it causes fatigue. It, you know, promotes sleepiness. But interestingly, during a migraine attack, adenosine levels spike. So by blocking adenosine, um, caffeine actually constricts blood vessels and reduces that sort of vascular component to migraine pain. And so there's evidence that a very small amount of caffeine at the migraine onset can actually abort or blunt the attack. So I'm talking, when I say a small amount of caffeine, I'm talking about like 100 milligrams of caffeine. That would be like a very strong cup of tea or a small, very small cup of coffee, right? And that's ideally something that's taken like really early, like right when you're starting to experience the migraine onset. Um, So I think, you know, the the consistency here is, you know, for most people, you don't want to take too much caffeine either. Um, Staying under like the 200 milligrams a day and just and keeping it regular is also important. As you may have known, like if you're taking caffeine and then you kind of abruptly withdraw, that can also trigger migraines and headaches as well. And then there's actually physical activity. Believe it or not, exercise is one of the most effective tools that we have for preventing migraines. And that's not always intuitive because for, you know, for some people, exercise can actually trigger a headache if they go like if they're going too hard, too fast, like too intense. But I think overall, if you look at the overall body of evidence, it's pretty clear that if you're doing like regular endurance strength training, it actually significantly reduces the frequency of migraines, att- migraine attacks. There was one randomized control trial where, you know, patients that frequently have migraines were divided into three groups. They either did aerobic cycling three times a week for about 40 minutes. There was another group that took this prescription drug for migraine prevention called topiramate. And then there was another group that did this relaxation therapy. And after three months, all three groups had roughly the same reduction in migraine frequency. And that's kind of remarkable because it does mean that this prophylactic exercise, just, you know, having your consistent exercise routine really does help, you know, you not have to take these prescription pharmaceuticals that often have side effects that are not desirable. Um, There was actually more recently another meta-analysis of multiple studies that was published in 2022. This was actually 21 different trials with over a thousand participants. It found that strength training was the actual, it was actually the most effective form of exercise for reducing migraine days. And that was followed by high intensity aerobic exercise. And that was then followed by moderate intensity exercise. So strength training, high intensity exercise, moderate intensity exercise, all of these were good. Um, the strength training reduced migraine frequency by about 3.5 days per month, while aerobic training reduced it by about two to three days per month. So they're pretty close. And again, it's it's consistency that's really important. All right, let's talk about diet. So migraines do have a strong metabolic and inflammatory component. So nutrition does make a difference in both prevention and severity. Um, skipping meals, doing intermittent fasting, obviously intermittent fasting can have a lot of benefits, but for people that are really prone to migraines, uh, fasting for too long can trigger a migraine in a lot of people, partly due to the decrease in blood glucose that sort of increases the excitability in the hypothalamus and the brainstem. And that sort of lowers this threshold for a migraine attack. So I think for people that are really prone 
two migraines, you probably want to avoid doing really long fasts. You want to try to eat at more regular intervals, um, really emphasizing protein and fiber, which helps stabilize blood sugar levels. You're not getting those spikes and crashes. And then um, diet composition is also very important. So omega-3 fatty acids, omega-6, right? So omega-3 are anti-inflammatory. Omega-6 are more pro-inflammatory. There's some, at least in one study, researchers put migraine patients on different diets to malip- manipulate the levels of omega-3 versus omega th- omega-6. So the group that had the increase in their omega-3s and also lowered their omega-6 had fewer headache days per month compared to the control group. But even a diet that didn't restrict the omega-6 only increased omega-3, they also reduced their migraine days as well um, compared to control. So I think at the end of the day, and I've said this time and time again, the most important thing that you can focus on is increasing your omega-3 intake. And that's where supplementing with fish oil really has been shown to have similar benefits. And in fact, there are clinical studies showing that supplementing with fish oil can um, have a benefit for migraines as well. And again, that probably has a lot to do with the inflammatory pathway. You're making these resolvins and protectins. They help resolve inflammation. They actually also help resolve pain signaling as well. So something else to keep in mind, uh, making sure that you're, you know, you don't have these so-called trigger foods. I mean, it's often highly variable, but there's 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 a good, I would say, rule of thumb to kind of keep a little bit of a food journal, particularly for someone that does have frequent migraines, because there are certain things that can trigger it in people like alcohol, red wine. Um, there's components in, in red wine like tyramine. Um, it's an aged cheese, uh, processed meats, things with nitrates, like people, MSG, like people can be triggered by these things and it can trigger a migraine. And so I think that's really important for people that are prone to it to, to kind of make sure they're avoiding those trigger types of, you know, chemicals and things that are found in certain foods. I think the Mediterranean style pattern diet is really the most evidence-based for reducing migraine uh, frequency as well. So again, that's the kind of diet that focuses a lot on foods that are high in omega-3 and you're getting a lot of protein, you're getting, you're getting a lot of fiber, you're getting minimal minerals, magnesium, things like that. And speaking of magnesium, that's also really important and very interesting. There's a lot of evidence looking at magnesium um, and and helping, you know, treat migraines as well as preventing migraines. Um, magnesium does stabilize neuronal membranes and it may help prevent the kind of brain hyperexcitability that can trigger attacks. Um, it also modulates the tone of blood vessels, which plays an important role in migraines. Magnesium is actually one of the most evidence-based you know, backed supplements for migraine treatment. There was a meta-analysis of randomized control studies that found oral magnesium supplementation reduced migraine frequency and intensity compared to placebo. Um, there was an intravenous studies that have shown intravenous magnesium also really mitigates even acute attacks as well. For regarding the dose, it seems like the best evidence supports a dose anywhere between 400 milligrams to 600 milligrams a day of oral magnesium. And that's usually in the form of citrate or glycinate for better absorption. And I personally, like if you can tolerate the 400 milligrams all at once, great. Some people that causes GI distress, but like you could do 200, 200, 200 if you're going for the 600 range, or you could just do 200, 200 if you're going for the 400 milligram range. And taking them in 200 milligram doses really does help prevent, you know, some of the the effects on, on the GI, you know, distress with respect to magnesium. Ginger is another interesting one as well. It cont- It contains these bioactive compounds like gingerols. And uh, shogalols that inhibit prostaglandins and leukotrienes. These are the molecules that do amplify pain and inflammation. There was one randomized controlled trial where people were taking 250 milligrams of ginger powder, and that was compared head to head with 50 milligrams of a prescription drug for migraines, sumatripan. And um, both groups experience almost identical reductions in pain after two hours. So that's kind of, to me, profound. If you can take something like ginger powder and avoid having to take these like pharmaceuticals, which we're still even figuring out what all the side effects are, um, I think that's great. Another one that's pretty interesting is riboflavin or vitamin B2. Um, This is one. So I already mentioned that, you know, people that get migraines 
often do show signs of like inefficient ATP production in their in their in their brain. Riboflavin is a cofactor for enzymes that make energy, you know, so it's really important for mitochondrial function. It boosts mitochondrial output. And there was there have been um, multiple meta analyses that have found, for example, one found um, 400 milligrams of riboflavin daily for three months significantly reduced migraine frequency. It reduced migraine duration and pain intensity. And then there's another study with um, very similar to riboflavin, but CoQ10, which is interesting because it also affects mitochondrial energy energy metabolism. Um, CoQ10 is important, you know, important for many things, but mitochondrial energy metabolism is the main thing. And there was a meta-analysis showing that CoQ10 supplementation around 300 milligrams a day reduced migraine frequency by about 1.8 attacks per month. Um, so it's really, there's like this theme with things that are affecting mitochondrial function really seem seem to support that it does reduce migraine frequency, duration, pain intensity as well. Alpha lipoic acid is another one. There's more, I would say smaller trials. There's not as much evidence as CoQ10 or riboflavin, but there's a couple of small trials showing that alpha lipoic acid, which is also important for mitochondrial health, um, at a dose of about 600 milligrams a day reduces migraine frequency and um, this is compared to placebo as well. I think generally speaking, it's good to think like I take alpha lipoic acid. I take CoQ10. I don't take high dose riboflavin. It's in my multivitamin, but you know, I generally am taking things that are supporting mitochondrial health. And so, you know, it's interesting that like, like taking those things that you should be taking anyways are also going to improve, you know, the migraine frequency and duration in people that are prone to those types of migraine attacks. Okay, there's some other evidence as well of acupuncture, perhaps, you know, playing playing a role, temperature therapy. So like cold, you know, cold constricts the blood vessels and reduces, much like caffeine constricts it, cold does as well. And that may reduce the, you know, inflammatory neuropeptides and things like that as well. So, I mean, I think if you're kind of looking for some sort of protocol, like, right, like what what would be a protocol in ret- in terms of like, you know, evening and morning routine, physical activity, nutrition throughout the day, supplement stack, things like that. You know, you really obviously want to keep a regular bedtime and a regular waking time. We talk about that really important focus on sleep and sleep hygiene and regular bedtimes and awake times. You want to, you know, get outdoor, get outdoors in the first 30 minutes. Very important to keep hydrated. You don't want to skip, you know, meals if you're prone to these migraines um, because of the crashes in blood glucose. You want to definitely be consistent with your physical activity. You want to, you know, be getting some high intensity, moderate intensity physical activity. You want to probably getting be getting at least thirty to fifty minutes, three to five times per week of that. And you want to add in a couple of sessions of resistance training as well. And this is something that just needs to be part of your your weekly routine. When it comes to nutrition, you obviously want to avoid the ultra processed foods, things that are high in omega six. You want to try to adopt more of like a Mediterranean type of diet, get a, a lot of omega-3s, make sure you're staying hydrated. Um, a little bit of, you know, caffeine may help, especially with the onset, like 100 milligrams may help with the onset. And then there's a supplement stack where we're talking about magnesium glycinate, magnesium citrate, either 400 to 600 milligrams a day, riboflavin, 400 milligrams a day, the CoQ10, Depending on the the source, so I like ubiquinol, which is more bioavailable. You can probably get get away with a lower dose, so anywhere between 100 to 300 milligrams daily, depending on the type of CoQ10, whether you're taking ubiquinol or ubiquinone. Ubiquinone, you really need to be up to the 300 milligrams a day. If you're taking ubiquinol, you can probably get away with half that dose, like 150 milligrams a day. Um, melatonin, also maybe like you know three milligrams at bedtime, especially if your sleep is irregular. Uh, but but more importantly would be the omega three fatty acids like getting it like at least the two grams a day so you're getting into that high omega three index of eight percent or more and then obviously the stress you know making sure that you're you're doing things that are mindful exercise deep breathing other relaxation tech you know techniques that help reduce the stress some people find this biofeedback and acupuncture and stuff like that can help it might be worth a try for people that are really desperate as well. Um, and then we talked about some of the things people can do during an attack, the immediate like 100 milligrams of caffeine if you tolerate that, the ginger powder, 250 to 500 milligrams. Um, you can sip a strong ginger tea or get the ginger powder. That seemed to really help equivocal to what a pharmaceutical drug did. 
you know, applying a cold pack, making sure you're hydrated as well. Um, so all those things can can really help with prevent with uh, during the acute attack as well. 